Hey, what's up everyone? Maury Crozen here from the Performance Lab of California and we're here to do another breakdown here today on Jim Hines. Jim Hines was the first person to beat or to break 10 second, the 10 second barrier in the 100 meter dash. So super interesting uh, to be able to break him down. Uh, obviously one of the, the fastest guys, you know, a um, always historic person when you're the first person to beat um to break that that 10 second mark so uh we'll go right on into his uh his sprint here this is when he broke it in the 68 olympics um really i mean when you're going through here so in, in 1968 there you could see the in well, just looking at everybody's form and here's here's where um jim hines is here uh the the thing that really stands out is that there's a lot of different form a lot of different technique you can tell there wasn't as much of a, of a focus on having very very clear technique which makes me go back to you know a lot of this does have to go back to genetics and really what it, it really goes back to uh, truthfully is how fast are you creating largest amounts of force and power in your lower body and how well can you effectively endure that power in the lower body because uh just like what we talked about in our online uh you know, um, sprint ebook, there's a big part of your overall um, running form that, that has to go with, with the leg cycle. And the leg cycle between everybody is actually pretty pretty well synced up. There's a couple guys that are a little bit different, but for the most part, um, everybody is pretty pretty much going with the same type of standards that, that we've always talked about. I mean, uh, we could see here in, uh, I want to say lane six here, or uh, lane five, sorry, we can see that he he goes and does an excellent job of and, and a little bit shorter guy. He does an excellent job of getting knee drive to extension and pulling back there and getting a lot of force there, which is why he's able to even compete in the Olympics. It, it, arms are, aren't necessarily great in terms of when you're going back into extension and, and trying to, to reach back. But overall, and, and that, that overall process of going back is a little bit wide. He's got a little bit wider shoulders, which is... You know, probably an impact on on his overall spread, but still very very effective there. Uh, going back to Jim Hines, though, that's really what we want to do with the the breakdown and seeing what what he does. I mean, um, just an, an excellent job of being able to stay light on his feet and being able to uh, bring be pretty consistent in in each one of his, his leg drives. I mean, we'll keep it nice and slow, but but notice his I mean, very quick and his ability. We're probably about. 20, 25 meters into the race, and he's already reaching that ability where he's able to stay very high up in each one of his steps, get full extension within the knee, come back, pull underneath him, and and transfer right into the the next uh, step. I would say overall leg um, range of motion in terms of maybe like quad range of motion we could probably get a little bit better. He doesn't do as good of a job of uh, really bringing that heel all the way up to the butt on the left side. He doesn't get as much height as you know, some of the, the Olympic sprinters or elite sprinters do now. Right side, it looks like he does a pretty good job of getting all the way up, making it so that, that right knee is still right behind that left knee. But still, you know, that goes right to the same point. There's a lot of very, very similar biomechanics that we're seeing, even what by Jim Hines back here, that would you want to incorporate today in order to be very, very effective as a sprinter. Left side, not as good. He has a little bit of a hip tilt. His right hip seems to want to stay a little bit higher than the left hip, which is probably why he's not able to get as much range of motion within that right quad. You know, if that hip's a little bit lower, now the overall range of motion and effectiveness to get that knee up and behind becomes a little bit more limited. When he's out with his left leg, uh, he's able to maintain much more evenness within that, that pelvis pelvic height, which makes it so then he can drink, drive that right heel up to his butt a little bit more effectively. Uh, another thing, too, is when he's landing, you can see right side when he lands, he stays pretty well upright, a little bit of a rotation towards us here within the spine, so that left hip is a little bit closer towards us, right hip is a little bit further back. Then we go on to the next one, and with the next step, when he goes and he's going to... Uh, to the landing, he's a little bit kind of hunched over. He's more straight ahead and how the spine alignment is, but he's definitely a little bit more kind of hunched over in, in the spine, not as straight up as he was on on this step when he lands. See how well he's able to kind of absorb here and, and take all, on that, that range and he keeps that, that spine in a lot better uh, position than he does on, on that, that left side. Uh, in terms of his hands, and we'll go into the hands now, Notice how with the right side, I mean, both sides, he ends up kind of crossing over his body. So on the right side, he goes, and on the way down, he has this little bit of a kind of first, I'm going to 
kind of internally rotate the shoulder and then go in and extend or bring my arm back, right? So the internal rotation of the shoulder is this movement, right? So if you can picture what this the arm is doing as you come down like that, all of your weight's kind of coming in, which you know means he's using his pec and then he's extending back. He does it much greater here. Notice how that hand is there. And he goes and he raises that elbow up pretty high um, as well as drops that front hand and then pulls back from there. Okay, he does it on the right side as well, but just not as uh, drastically as he does on his left hand. So there's a little bit of this kind of, you know, rotation that he's doing to help him get probably a little bit more lat activation that would help there, as well as getting the pec to get a little bit more involved as he's going into extension. So there's actually muscles that would help prevent extension, which he's ha having them get more active as he's going into extension, which makes it so there's more of a, what's called eccentric stretch or lengthening of the muscle as he's going back uh, to make it so then he is generating more force as he's coming back forward. So that's the big thing about being able to get those elbows back behind you is now when he comes back forward, there's a lot of power being generated in his upper body and that's gonna help him get lift off the ground. Okay, you wanna be able to, as you're pressing off, you wanna be able to get your body to really be able to stay up off the ground the best that you can and stay tall because if you're uh, losing a lot of, of overall, if your body's going up and down, if you're losing overall height as you're running, then you're not able to properly absorb the weight as, as you're going through the sprint. And you can see here with him, he's very good at when he lands, his head doesn't go up or down really at all. It's always staying at about the same level, which is super important when it comes in terms of uh, efficiency. Right, and, and one of the reasons that he's able to stay very efficient is because so when he lands on his foot, he endures the weight very well within the spine, within the core, within the legs, and then as he pushes off, he does a very good, good and effective job of getting a good push within that opposite arm to make it so he drives his body upwards and he gets a, a vertical action there, rather than staying too far horizontal. And the combination of both of those, when it comes to you know sprinting and your effectiveness as a sprinter and that is the key combination is, is how well can you efficiently transfer between legs without you know allowing your body to, to to transmit too much force up and down and then how do you achieve that one of the two ways that you achieve it is by being very very um strong in your deceleration phase or when you land making sure that you're able to endure the, the weight coming downwards and you, your body doesn't you know sink down too much and to then make it so you have to fight your fight with gravity to push back up um the other part of it is going to be how well you use your arms and you know creating vertical force or really just as you push off how well do you create vertical force upwards during that phase uh, in, compor in comparison to creating more of that horizontal or outward push or really not getting any you know verticality at all you're just kind of staying um at like a you know, a high to low level, okay? And, and that's a very complex thing that, that I kind of went into right there. Um, I hope you guys can visualize what I'm talking about. Essentially, what that is describing is how do you sprint and keep your head level about the same, right? It's all about your deceleration phase and keeping tall during that deceleration phase, which is when you're landing, as well as when you push off, making sure that you're creating vertical force as you push off because really he's creating vertical force but the reason he's staying the same height is because that vertical force and the momentum is actually carrying him horizontally he's not focusing on a horizontal push which would be more of a pushing off that way so um, again i hope that doesn't go too far over your guys's head if you have any questions please reach out to me also check out our ebook check out our speed program 12 week speed program we can go more in depth into your personal things that you need to work on give you some programming some exercises to do some workouts to do how do can we make you the most effective overall sprinter that you could possibly possibly be as always guys thanks for watching these videos and we will see you soon